Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. I think it's been a really interesting two days. Um, I missed part of the session yesterday, unfortunately. Um, but I really love how diverse it is in, in terms of disciplines, because I think that's quite unusual for um, a MAP conference. The ones I've been to are usually just about philosophy as a discipline. So I've really found that interesting. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a bit of a mouth, mouthful of a title. But, um, the basic idea is, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about how philosophy has been localized to European traditions and why I'm going to talk about why that's paradoxical. And I'm going to argue that there's um, an interesting thing to focus on in, in tandem with that issue, which is how um, Europe kind of understood China in the 18th century. And it'll become clear why I think the two questions of the localization of philosophy on the one hand and um, Europe's engagement with China when they first kind of encountered Chinese texts, why those two like are usefully thought about together. Um, and then the second part of my paper is going to focus on a kind of odd comparative um, analysis that can be found in Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy where he brings together um, early Greek texts and early Chinese texts. This is actually two texts in particular. On the one hand, Parmenides' fragments, so Parmenides being a pre-Socratic philosopher, and on the other hand, um, chapters from the Laozi, which are um, kind of, so he only had access to five chapters. If people are interested in exactly what he knew about the Laozi, I'm happy to give you his translations. He was basing his understanding of the Laozi on a translation by Eben Temuza, who's a French sinologist from the early 19th century. Um, and so he, those translations were in French and Latin. So you can imagine all the misunderstandings that occur when you're reading about a Chinese text in languages that you don't even fully understand yourself. And, but nevertheless, I'm going to argue that there's something interesting about the comparative analysis that he um, provides. And the second point, which is probably more interesting for the purposes of this conference, is that um, his bias is really exposed by the comparative analysis. Because as I'm going to show, he has a pretty interesting conceptual analysis that brings together the concept of Tao in the, in the Taoist tradition um, and the concept of being in, in kind of early Greek philosophy. And he actually thinks they're, they're really comparable concepts. And yet the value judgments about kind of the import of these two concepts are completely opposite. So obviously, they're going to be positive in the case of Parmenides and extremely negative in the case of Taoism. And I think that's really revealing of how bias creeps into the analysis. And there's probably racial bias to that, but that's something I'll talk about later. Oops. OK, so first of all, the paradoxical parochialism of philosophy. Um, this is the term that was coined by um, Professor Robert Benosconi. Um, so I've talked about localization in my title, and it'll become clear why I've used that term instead of parochialism. But the bigger picture idea is precisely kind of how philosophy as a discipline in Europe is inherently parochial. Um, and so the way uh, Professor Bernasconi puts it is um, there's an apparent tension between the alleged universality of reason, which of course Enlightenment thinkers are the first to champion, and the fact that its upholders are so intent on localizing its, its historical instantiation. And this is what he calls this paradox of um, philosophy's parochialism. And he's followed by a number of um, people who talked about the formation of the so-called canon in Europe, who kind of agree with him that, well, first of all, this is kind of a problem, obviously, for philosophers. They really need to scrutinize. But secondly, this kind of transition um, or this kind of increased parochialism in philosophy really kind of became more pronounced in the 18th century. Um, and Robert Bernasconi's argument is that actually when the Jesuits went to China and kind of discovered a tradition which to them immediately looked like philosophy, over the course of about 200 years, that kind of um, sense of kind of insecurity at finding a kind of tradition that they deemed to be philosophical actually ended up backfiring in that Europe became extremely defensive about what should count as philosophy. And this is when the parochialism becomes extremely pronounced. Um, and then if, I don't know if anyone um, has heard of Taking Back Philosophy, which is kind of a, quite a polemical text by a sinologist, Brian Van Norden, who, well, he's a sinologist and philosopher, who kind of makes this emphatic point about taking back philosophy, because he thinks that precisely the idea of philosophy was not as parochial as it is today back in, say, the 16th century. And so he wants to kind of reclaim it 
on behalf of um, Chinese philosophical traditions. Um, and he talks about philosophical ethnocentrism, much in the same vein as Bernasconi and Park, who talk about canon. So um, just to summarize the state of things before the, the late 18th century in um, kind of European um, appraisals of non-European traditions. So it's quite striking that um, the Jesuit, um, Couplet, um, immediately kind of, well, he had no problem with saying that Confucius was the philosopher of the Chinese. So it's kind of the name of work he wrote about um, Chinese philosophy. And this is around 16, yeah, 1687. Um, so that in itself is interesting. The question of whether um, China had philosophy was not even up for grabs. It was just not something that people argued about, um, which is far from the case today, for instance, in modern philosophy departments. Um, and then we have um, Bishop William Warburton, who's a figure in the clergy in, in England and also a thinker who makes a really interesting claim about how the most established fact regarding antiquity is that the Greeks got philosophy from the Egyptians. So this is really interesting because he, he generally thinks this is probably the most uncontroversial thing to think about kind of Greek philosophy, that it actually came from Egypt. So um, that's another interesting point about how the canon was quite different at the time. Um, and then you have Christian Wolff, who famously um, wrote about uh, ethics, political philosophy, and Confucianism. So he wrote about practical philosophy of the Chinese. That's the title of his work. Um, and he actually was um, banished from Prussia on pain of death because he argued that the Confucian um, ethical framework um, was much more sound than kind of the ethics that were in vogue in, in Europe at the time that were largely um, grounded in the kind of Christian ethical framework. And he thinks, well, this, this framework is much more rational. It doesn't rely on revelation. Um, and so he got into a lot of trouble for that. Leibniz um, similarly was really struck by the kind of um, import of the ethical framework that he kind of discovered in, in Neo-Confucian texts and in Confucian texts. He didn't really study Chinese texts directly. He got most of his opinions about China via um, a Jesuit called Bouvet. And I'll talk about that more and why that's problematic in a minute. But the point is, he, he kind of agrees with, with um, Wolf that the ethical framework is really um, important and, and valuable in, in Confucianism. But of course, he's ashamed to admit that, well, he, he says something like, well, yeah, it's so almost shameful to confess this. So you're admitting to the superiority of a framework that's not European when it comes to ethics. And Voltaire similarly says, um, Confucius was the first moral philosopher, so he disputes the claim that Aristotle was like the greatest kind of ethical thinker. But he again says, oh, this is a disgrace for Occidental nations. So you can see how there's kind of this tension going on, even in these kind of more um, so-called charitable thinkers towards non-European traditions. Um, and another example of this kind of willingness to engage with non-European traditions is Diderot, who talks about the philosophy of the Canadians, by which he means I'm not exactly sure which traditions he's referring to, but they're Native American traditions that um, he kind of found out about um, that were in Canada. And so he talks about their beliefs about the immortality of the soul, about, um, yeah, their conceptions of um, the self, et cetera. And, okay, but I want to kind of mess with what I've just said, because I think one of the tendencies that philosophers have is to think, well, philosophy is this really kind of, um, they tend to think that philosophy is this really kind of elevated field that's kind of the epitome of intellectual kind of activity, et cetera. Um, it's the highest kind of mo most rigorous form of um, think critical thinking about the world. But actually what was going on in the kind of early 18th century and previously as well in the 17th and 16th centuries was there was a, a pretty kind of stark opposition between theology and philosophy. And the reason that's important is that when European thinkers say, oh, there's philosophy in China, they're not necessarily saying, oh, this is like the most um, advanced form of intellectual um, thought that we find anywhere in the world. They're saying, well, there's room for rational thinking in these texts, but they're not quite on a par with Christian revelatory texts in many cases. So I'm not saying that this is what Wolf was saying. Wolf was definitely criticizing Christianity and superstition um, in what he took to be kind of the excesses of um, superstition in, 
in religion. But there are interesting cases where you find European thinkers actually arguing that, well, a pagan text, so for example, um, Plato's kind of dialogues, um, and of course, Chinese texts, which they thought were kind of atheist, um, many of them at least, they say things like, well, these texts attest to the natural light of reason. There's clearly rational thinking going on, um, but they don't quite get access to revelation. So this is the view that Aquinas put forward, obviously not in the case of China, because we're talking 13th century, but he says this about, say, Plato. So the idea is, well, with reason, you can get quite far, but not quite to the ultimate kind of truth about the world. Metaphysics is only the field that's, sorry, the field of metaphysics is reserved to theologians and not to philosophers. So there is a hierarchy that's quite different um, in this period. Now, if you fast forward to say, um, Matteo Ricci, who's one of the first Jesuit um, missionaries to go to China and who actually learned Chinese quite seriously, unlike most of his contemporaries, um, he kind of um, insisted that the, the Chinese texts show um, a really strong exercise of natural reason, and, that, and he thinks that using reason is sufficient to get the insights that people would get for revelation. So he tries to argue that Chinese texts were somehow able to have access to those truths that Christians take to be true, even though they did it strictly through reason. Um, so th that's quite an interesting approach. It's not necessarily that unusual in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle Ages, and often these kinds of arguments were used to justify reading uh, Ibn Sina or Avicenna and Ibn Rush, so Verwees as he's known in Europe. So those two um, Islamic thinkers were often kind of legitimized because, well, on the basis of the fact that they exercised <coughs> reason. But then there's a really much stranger view that's in vogue at the time, which is um, the Hermetic tradition. And the Hermetic tradition holds that it takes very seriously this kind of um, conception of history according to which the world came into being about 5,000 years ago. Um, and so the more ancient the text, the closer it'll be to the culture of the patriarchs. And so they actually think that the Chinese texts that they encountered, such, such as the Yijing, which is a Dao, well, a proto-Daoist text, um, they think this text is in a sense um, one of the oldest artifacts attesting to biblical kind of era times. Um, and so they think it's worth reading the Yijing on the basis that somehow it's going to reveal truth about um, revelation. Um, and so this is their basis for actually reading the, ch the Chinese text seriously. So it's a really messed up rationale. They're projecting Christian revelation onto the Chinese texts on the basis of this kind of conception of history that's very Christian. Um, and so the reason why this is important is that people like Leibniz, um, who famously, of course, kind of insisted on this principle of the universality of reason, bought into this idea, it seems. Um, so he relied on Bouvet's accounts, who was one of these people who was in this hermetic tradition. Um, and he thought that um, you could kind of suss out these uh, truths of revelation in, in these Chinese texts. Um, so I, this was, all of this was just to kind of um, mess with the idea that when you recognize a tradition as being philosophical, you don't necessarily mean that it's interesting on its own terms because of kind of interesting arguments that are being made or certain modes of reasoning or modes of inquiry that are worth investing on their own terms. No, what you mean is, well, they're like giving some justification for revelation or they're compatible with Christian revelation. And so one thing that I think is quite useful, um, Karine Defort, who's a prominent sinologist, um, has actually really emphasized this idea that, well, when you recognize Chinese philosophy, when you admit that there's such a thing as Chinese philosophy, you're not necessarily interested in the content and you don't necessarily understand it. You're just kind of saying, well, it's there and it says nothing about your appreciation of it. And she points out that Hegel was one of those people who kind of acknowledge that there may have been something like philosophy, even though he, he really fundamentally misunderstood a lot of it. Um, now, this is just by way of giving you a summary of what happened in the late 18th century. It's believed that Tiedemann um, was the first, the first historian of philosophy to make a claim that Thales was the first Greek philosopher. Sorry, that Thales, as the first Greek philosopher, was the first philosopher. So the narrative that Greece is the kind of birthplace of philosophy really starts to gain currency at this time. And we're talking one generation after people like Warburton and Voltaire and the rest of them. So there's a really radical shift that goes on right after the French Revolution, which in itself is quite interesting. 
Um, and so you find not only Tiedemann, but Tenman, who's another historian of philosophy who kind of tries to explain away the evidence even in Greek testimony about to the effect that people like Pythagoras actually got inspiration from Egyptian thought. So Pythagoras, this is testimony that you can find in Isocrates. And Isocrates says explicitly that Pythagoras um, engaged with the religion and philosophy of the Egyptians and that he returned to Greece and that's how we got kind of Greek philosophy. And Tenman claims that, oh, actually Pythagoras just went to like become more famous. And this is literally an argument that you can still hear in Greek philosophy lectures um, in the Anglo-European world. And he's seconded by Hegel, who again dismisses this idea that Egypt and India may have contributed to some of the, for example, the theories of um, um, reincarnation that you find in Greek philosophy. And it's today it's more or less recognized that probably there was a kind of Eastern source for that in Plato, but people just tend not to mention it. And then the kind of radicalization of this idea that philosophy is inherently European is happens with Heidegger, who kind of says, well, it's just a tautology to talk about European philosophy because philosophy just is European. And so, but what I want to stress is that this was by no means kind of the received view up until the late 18th century. And Heidegger still had to say this. So, whereas I think today amongst many philosophers in in kind of their, within the comfortable confines of their departments, they don't even think like they need to justify this assumption. But right up until Heidegger, it was something you had to justify. And this is what you find in Hegel as well, which I'm about to turn to. But yeah, Derrida is another case where he went to China in 2001, gave a speech, and actually had the nerve to say, there's philosophy, uh, sorry, there's not philosophy, but there's thought, whatever that means. Um, I think the term he used with, was pensée in French, which, is a bit better than thought, I suppose, but it's really not clear what the distinction is meant to be. And then all of this is this kind of, um, this tendency that you find in the late 18th century is usually backed up by claims like, um, oh, well, you know, Thales is the first individual thinker that we can talk about. So they kind of start to use this idea that you need the individual to, to kind of ground um, a sound philosophical um, tradition. And so this is part of how they, they kind of justify the exclusion that, that kind of became really popular. So again, you have this disappearance of relative plurality, um, however imperfect it was. Uh, and then you also have arbitrary exclusions. So what I mean by that is, even if you accept that philosophy is born in Greece, you still can't exclude aspects of Egypt, Egyptian thought, because the Greeks themselves actually admit like, well, we engage with Egyptian thinking, it came down to us. So if you have like this linear conception of the history of philosophy, which in itself poses problems, but even if you're committed to that, you shouldn't be able to exclude Egypt from the picture. So there's a contradiction there. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna talk about this because I don't have time, but if anyone's interested in the q and I can talk about what people are now discussing as being problematic about the whole debate surrounding whether Chinese philosophy is kind of legitimate um, debate to be having, because there are all kinds of assumptions that people are confused about when they, fight about, well, is it right to talk about Chinese philosophy? But that's kind of a separate question. Okay, so Hegel's comparative framework. So there are numerous occasions where he talks about how uh, world history travels from east to west, and he has all these claims about how historical progress correlates with this movement from China to, to Europe. Um, and he literally thinks that history first arises in China because he thinks that the first case of a state occurs in China. And he's actually reluctant to admit that this is the case. So he says things like, China has unhistorical history, um, typical Hegel fashion. But the point is, he can't really get out of saying that, there, that China played a really important role in kind of creating this conception of the state. If you think of the world like, I mean, if you're Hegel and you think that guys travels from place to place and unfolding itself, um, you can't just deny that China played a role in that because the state is key to the unfolding of freedom, which for Hegel is kind of the goal of history. Um, and so the other problem this poses is that he can't get out of saying that China has this concept of freedom and it's unfolding um, because if it has a conception of the state, it necessarily also has a concept of freedom. Um, that's a necessary impl implication of Hegel's framework. I'm not saying it makes any sense, but that's his assumptions. Um, the problem is he'll deny that the Chinese had freedom, and I'm, I'm going to turn to that in a moment. Um, okay, so just by way of, this will be really brief, but 
one kind of objection that people often have about criticizing Hegel's or centrism is that, oh, well, maybe he didn't know any better. Um, but that's not true. Um, there are contemporaries of his who did much better than him, who had the same kind of resources available to them, even people much earlier than him. So Montaigne is a case of someone who was really conscious of kind of um, cultural difference. Schelling was much, much more informed about Taoism than Hegel was and had access to slightly more, but very little more. Um, and Polis actually criticized Hegel's philosophy of right. Um, he wrote a review of it when it came out and kind of criticized Hegel for localizing the actuality or reality um, in Europe. I mean, he said it just makes no sense at all. And so this kind of was a contemporary criticism of Hegel on his, Euro his Eurocentrism. Um, so it's clearly not an anachronistic charge to have. Um, so, yeah, I just want to briefly mention that there are some obstacles to understanding the extent to which Hegel actually did engage with China, because it's easy to think, well, he didn't know anything. He doesn't even talk about China, apart from the lectures on, on the history of, sorry, on the lectures on the philosophy of religion. But actually, that's not true. So the latest tr um, translation of the lectures on the history of philosophy actually don't have the full account on China or India. And this in itself is interesting, but the exclusion survives to this day because um, when the first um, edition was made by one of his pupils, Michelet, they decided to use a certain version of the lectures which didn't comprise the most extensive engagement with China. So this edition has about four pages on China, whereas uh, the Hofmeister um, edition that was published in 1928 which gathers many more lectures that Hegel gave on this topic, have about 17 pages. Um, and then the lectures on the history of world history also have a massive exclusion um, of many of the things that um, Hegel said about China. The people who were responsible for that were um, Hegel's son himself, so Carl Hegel, as well as, as his editor at the time, um, who kind of thought that he focused too much on China and they actively just chose to ignore much of what he'd said in their decisive edition, because all of this was published after his death. Um, but actually, this one does comprise all of what was said about China. It's, it's really new, and it has a really good commentary. And um, they, they kind of trade Hegel's sources on China at this specific time. What's unfortunate is that these lectures, the his, lectures on the history of philosophy, came later, and he knew much more about China by then. And this edition just doesn't have um, the full extent of what he said about China. Um, and so, yeah, just to give you a sense of how much he actually said about the so-called Oriental world, as he puts it, he dedicates 160 pages to China, India, Persia, and Egypt, which is more than he dedicates to the Germanic world, Rome and Greece combined in the lectures on the philosophy of world history. So that just gives you a sense of like the quantity of what he said. Um, okay, so he is willing to grant that there's, um, that cross-cultural comparisons are possible, and he alludes to this, um, possibility of comparing the concept of being in Parmenides when he mentions Eliadicism, so that's a reference to Parmenides. And then he talks about um, Chinese and Indian philosophy, and he kind of grants that there's um, fertile ground for comparative work. Um, the only problem is when he starts um, comparing those concepts, his value judgments are extremely positive in the case of the Greek case. So, you know, this pure abstract thought, um, tremendous advance to this notion of progress that he claims is inherent in Greek philosophy. Um, for the first time, freedom becomes to be apparent. Um, but yet he grants that this is still abstract thinking, which for him apparently is deemed primitive when he talks about Chinese philosophy. <laughs> so he says that the Chinese stop at the level of abstraction. Um, it's an arid tradition. It's stuck. Um, and so you can see how there's this massive double standard going on. And the reason why this double standard is evident is um, when he compares the concept of wuyo, which is like ultimate reality, Tao in the Taoist text, known as the Lao Tzu, um, and the concept of being in Parmenides, he actually makes, um, in, in both cases, he thinks that what's going on is a description of a kind of pure being, a conception of the world without internal distinctions, without determination, um, a conception of, the, of kind of reality according to which um, like the most fundamental level of reality is devoid of attributes. And you, the account is, is literally equivalent in the Greek case and in the Chinese case. Um, the only difference, and he says it himself, that the, the Greeks kind of have an affirmative way of putting it, namely being, as in should pure being, devoid of attributes. 
Whereas in the Chinese case, they talk about it in a kind of um, in a kind of negative sense because they they actually emphasize the lack of attributes, but they don't mean nothingness in terms of say. Um, it's not like a denial of reality or nihilism. That's kind of what he's getting at. They're actually talking about very similar things. Um, and this passage um, that I put there in the PowerPoint is, I think, the evidence that shows that he does think that these concepts are pretty much the same. Um, that, that's my translation um, because it's not available in English. But yeah, the important point is the value judgments are undermined by his own conceptual analysis. Um, and so again, he seems to kind of go back and forth on whether like this abstract thinking is a positive thing or a negative thing. And it just depends on whether he's talking about the Greeks or the Chinese. Um, so to conclude, uh, the late 18th century was a turning point, um, I've argued. And part of, the, part of what happened is that um, the relative pluralism that you found in certain kind of early enlightenment thinkers um, was kind of rejected in favor of a narrative or linear concep conception of the history of philosophy. Um, and then there are kind of incoherences even within the linear account whereby Egypt is excluded. Um, the other point I wanted to emphasize is that Hegel's Eurocentrism is not from a position of utter ignorance, contrary to what we might think. Um, and actually he does provide some interesting scope for comparative work, but then completely undermines it by his normative kind of um, assumptions about the value of Greek philosophy versus Chinese philosophy. Um, and then, yeah, the punchline is, in a sense, we can learn from Hegel because I think philosophers today just take for granted that philosophy is, Greek, is, a, is originally a Greek enterprise, but Hegel still had to kind of argue for that. And I mean, that's not, it's not to say Hegel was right to think this, but he at least had to kind of make something up to say that the Greeks were pure, but actually, um, that's undermined by his own conceptual analysis. So that was my argument. <laughs>